Hi everyone, we are so excited to showcase our, <laughs> our project, which all target local action planning for the climate crisis, community resilience and justice. My name is Shannon Hessler. Um, first, we would like to share how our communities inspired us to do this type of work. Should I go again? Okay. <laughs> uh, first, we'd like to showcase how our communities inspired us to do this kind of work. Jenny? Uh -huh. <laughs> my, my name is Jenny Nitsky and I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Growing up, I saw a lot of environmental degradation, including poor air quality from smog, mismanagement of water resources, decreasing dependency on monsoon season and an overwhelming amount of single use plastics. And it was really disheartening and frightening for me as a child, especially considering so many people around me didn't share the same concern, which consequently made me want to act more. And so, you know, I was the kid that crawled through the dumpster to find recyclables. And I was the kid that brought a recycle bin to house parties because it was my only, is what I thought was the only way of taking climate action at the individual level at the time. Uh so again, my name is Shannon. Uh, I grew up in the really small mountain community of Fair Play, Colorado, which is not that far from here. And I grew up playing outside. Uh, I learned to ski pretty much the same time I learned to walk. And so my entire life has been defined by playing outside and being in the mountains. And I watched from a very young age, probably like that age, as uh, ski season got shorter from climate change and wildfire season got longer and more intense. My dad's a wildland firefighter, so I watched as climate change was having a direct impact on my family and the lives and livelihood of those in my small community. So I'm very excited because I've known since I was that age that I wanted to work on saving the world to be doing this kind of work here today. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Chris. I grew up in central Florida. And what stands out in my memory about that time is the time spent at the beach and water, water everywhere. Uh, that instilled me, that, that instilled in me a, a comforting complexity and the systems that support us. Uh, though my love for Gatorland has faded over the years, my love for the living world remains. Uh, seemingly ever present in Florida and Colorado, the sun presents an obvious opportunity uh, to pursue energy sovereignty. I'll pass it back to Shannon and Jenny to talk more about their project. Not quite. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so historically, the dominant narrative of the uh, environmental movement has been whitewashed and most accessible to the upper class. Contemporary Western environmentalism has often involved initiatives that address the symptoms of climate change, but do not address root causes. And by that, I mean that we have not been putting people first. And so in order to successfully plan at a, a local level, we need to um, attempt to solve these issues by putting people first, otherwise, um, they will serve as band-aid solutions and not address the root causes of climate change. So climate justice is the main framework that we all have applied to these projects. And climate justice centers communities. We know that climate change is going to impact the environment and all levels of society, but it's going to impact levels of society differently. And our most vulnerable populations, which are groups that are at higher risk for climate change impacts due to their social, political, economic status are going to be more impacted more quickly uh, by climate change. And they have less resiliency and less ability to adapt to a changing climate. So climate change, climate justice tries to alleviate these burdens and ensure equitable access to all the benefits of sustainable transitions like healthy local food and clean renewable energy. So what does climate preparedness look like on a local level? Well, it's going to look different everywhere. Addressing the Texas blackouts is different than dressing, addressing floods in BC and Germany, and it's different than dressing fire and drought here in Colorado. Strategic local planning with diverse stakeholder input brings about contextualized climate readiness 
uh, at multiple scales. <clears throat> Here in Colorado, there's a lot of cool local action going on. Uh, where I live in San Miguel County, there's a payment for ecosystem services plan. All across Colorado, low and medium income households are eligible for energy efficiency upgrades. Um, lots of local co-ops are now re renegotiating their contracts to allow for more locally produced uh, energy. And I will let Jenny and Shannon talk about some of the action going on here in the Gunnison Valley. Chris, thanks, Chris. So again, my name is Shannon, and I am very, very excited to share with you Gunny Cares 2030, our climate action, resiliency, and environmental sustainability plan to help the city of Gunnison reduce emissions and adapt to a changing climate. It is a really amazing example of local action planning right here in Gunnison for the climate crisis. And again, my name is Jenny Nitsky. So, oh, next slide. So for most of our lives, Shannon and I have had something called eco despair, which is a type of sometimes crippling grief or anxiety about the future of our planet and of humanity and our ecosystems due to climate change. Climate change can be very daunting and overwhelming, especially when trying to think about how your individual actions can make a difference. Media's coverage and the federal government's lackluster approach to climate action has been disheartening to say the least. But throughout this process and throughout our lives of having this eco despair, Shannon and I have realized an antidote to it. And that is local climate justice work. And that's why for our project, we wanted to join our local government to try to make a difference right here in our backyard. With that framework, as well as the clicker now turned on, maybe, can you do the next slide what am i supposed to be okay all right <laughs> so with all of that in mind um <laughs> i would like to give you a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about today so first we're going to go through how this project got started and how jenny and i became involved and then we'll talk a little bit about the science that informed this plan when we did a greenhouse gas emissions inventory We'll talk about how our stakeholders and community members really informed the action items in this plan, how we considered climate justice throughout the planning process. And then we will leave you all with the importance of local action and community engagement, as well as a call for action for you all today. Next slide. Okay, so this project began with the city of Gunnison. So in their vision statement, it says, in the future, we will realize a sustainable carbon neutral future addressing energy and water resource consumption. And so the impetus for that was really the community having huge emphasis on environmental sustainability, really wanting the local government to prioritize environmental sustainability. And so in the 2020 strategic and comprehensive plans, there was really long sections about environmental sustainability and there was an action item that was hire a sustainability intern to work on a sustainability plan. In April of 2021, that one sustainability intern turned into two and the sustainability plan turned into a CARES plan. CARES is an acronym that we came up with that stands for climate action, resilience, and environmental sustainability. And very quickly, it became apparent that the three components of environmental sustainability that were really valued by the community were energy, water, and waste. Uh, in 2020, there was a climate action conference here on campus, and in that conference, there was a lot of community support for climate action, and there was a lot of amazing ideas generated, but there was no way to track progress and no metrics for achieving any kind of actual measurable success. So the first thing that Jenny and I did as part of this project was complete a greenhouse gas emissions 
inventory. Yes. Um, <laughs> which, what a greenhouse gas emissions inventory is, is a way of telling the story of where emissions in a community are coming from that are contributing to climate change. So here in Gunnison, we did one for 2020. This is our baseline. And you can see the big green and the big blue sectors are commercial and residential energy. So that means that most of our emissions are coming from energy going to buildings. So that's heating, that's electricity, that's operations, is that huge sector. The next biggest sector is transportation and mobile sources. So that's all the emissions that are coming out of your car exhaust, coming from the airplanes, coming from buses, anything that uses fossil fuels is contributing to that category. Finally, that last sector is from solid waste, and that is mostly organic things that are decomposing in the landfill and producing really potent uh, greenhouse gases in the landfill. So knowing where all of our emissions come from allows us to target specific actions for reduction. And the international or the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC, recommends that we hit at least a 50% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions all across the world in order to mitigate the most catastrophic effects of global warming. And so in order to do that, we have to work locally on reducing by at least 50%. And we identified seven specific priority actions that are in the plan on how to mitigate our emissions. And for example, uh, to target those big blue and green sectors, the energy, we want to electrify everything. So new and existing buildings, that's decreasing natural gas and propane and increasing electrification. And then to complement that, we want to increase to 100% all of our carbon-free electricity going to the grid. So clean energy and all electricity. And then to target transportation and mobile sources, we want to increase electric vehicle cap cap capabilities in the city, as well as increase alternative transportation. And then to get at all the waste decomposing in the landfill, we recommend a climate solution you'll hear a lot about during this panel community forum, which is compost. Um, so like I said, we have seven actions that are identified for each of the sectors. And you can see in this graph, we're at 2020, that's our baseline. Each of these colors represents a different sector. And if we take those seven actions that were identified in the plan, we're going to hit that by 2030 on the far right side, that 50% reduction. However, that's seven actions, and in this entire plan, there's 170 actions. So with the support of ICLE, or Local Governments for Sustainability, we developed these very specific goal or metrics and reduction strategies, but that's only a very small part of the plan. The rest of the plan, the other 170 actions were informed by our expert stakeholders. So like Shannon said, our expert stakeholders were critical to the development of this plan. We could not have done it without them. Um, the first couple that we would like to acknowledge uh, that came to our four different stakeholder workshops last fall in the areas of resiliency, energy, water, and waste were the Gunnison Valley Regional Housing Authority and their program GB Heat and the Upper Gunnison River Water Conservancy District. Both of those organizations were critical in the development of results and goals and some key strategies and actions in the areas of particularly energy and waste. Many of the people working for those organizations will be critical in the implementation of actions, so we could not have done this without their expertise. We also worked with numerous departments within the city of Gunnison, including the city manager's office, which we worked under. The city manager, Russ Forrest, was our supervisor and um, he deserves a lot of credit in the development of this plan as well. He was an excellent guide throughout this last year. We also worked with the community development department, the city clerk's office, emergency responders such as the police chief and the fire marshal, the public works department, the public works director and the public works superintendents attended all of our stakeholder workshop meetings and they helped us make sure that the actions that were going into the plan were feasible for the city because like some of these other organizations, they will be critical in the implementation of actions. And we also worked with city council. We met with them four times throughout the last year, and we were making sure that they were privy to any changes made in the plan and that we incorporated their feedback. We'd like to 
extend a special thank you to Mayor Diego Plata for his over 1,000 editorial comments in this plan. It would not be as finesse without his keen eye. <laughs> yeah. We also worked with Western Colorado University. We had numerous staff and faculty sit in on these workshops. And we also helped to write a letter of intent for a grant that we will, be, we will hear about on May 11th if we're invited to apply. But it's between Western, the city, and the county for $1 million to increase climate action initiatives in the city of Gunnison. So fingers crossed. And then like Shannon said, we work with local governments for sustainability, ICLE, and they helped make sure that our goals and results, strategies, and actions were all um, ground truth by science. And then we worked with Gunnison County staff to make sure that our climate action plan was in alignment with theirs. We also worked with the Gunnison Country Chamber of Commerce. They attended our waste stakeholder workshop meeting, and we brought to them an idea for a Gunnison Green Business Certification last fall to their board of directors. And with their support, we found four incredible interns in the ENVS undergrad department who helped bring this to life. And it's one of the first actions in the plan that has come to fruition. So we wanna thank the Chamber of Commerce and those incredible interns for their collaboration. We also worked with Gunnison Country Times throughout the last year. They wrote four different articles on this plan and interviewed us for their uh, podcast, City Talk. We were able to uh, increase transparency of the plan and let residents know how and when they could be involved in the planning process because of them. We also worked with local energy, we also worked with local producers, local energy providers, local construction workers, and local nonprofit leaders. We also wanted to make sure that we understood how municipal operations worked. So we attend, so we visited the Gunnison County landfill, the wastewater treatment facility, and the waste management facility in Grand Junction. And we presented to numerous groups in the Valley to garner support, including the Gunnison Valley Climate Crisis Coalition, Immigrantes Unidos with the help of the Community Outreach Liaison to bring forward some education about recycling opportunities to our immigrant and Spanish speaking populations. And we presented to our local chapter of Rotary International. Not only were these expert stakeholders important, but you, the general public were as well. We wanted to make sure that constituent voices were heard and so last fall, we hosted a sustainability open house here on campus where we had over 70 attendees come and ask us questions about each of the five sections and give us their feedback in interactive ways. We wanted to make sure that community voice was a big part of this plan. And so in addition to this open house, we also had a two week public commenting period where people could go on the city of Gunnison's website, look at a draft of the plan and give us their feedback. We received quite a bit, mostly constructive and some non-constructive feedback and incorporated as much as was relevant into the plan. Something that we heard a lot was the issue of affordability. Oftentimes affordability and environmental sustainability are pitted against one another. And we wanted to make sure that our residents knew that this was a priority of the city. It's no surprise that the city of Gunnison and many other mountain communities are facing a housing crisis. And so we viewed this plan through a lens of affordability and made sure to incorporate specific actions that even touched on affordable housing itself. And so thanks to all of this community collaboration, we were able to show city council that this wasn't just a plan created by the city on behalf of the people without their input, but really it was a community developed plan um, and a community supported plan. And thanks to that, Last Tuesday on April 26, 2022, City Council unanimously adopted Gunny Cares 2030. And I will now pass it off to Shannon to show you some concrete examples of our deliverable that has been passed around. Yeah, so there is a few copies of Gunny Cares floating around the audience. Um, it's also available online for those of you on Zoom. We'll provide the info at the end of this presentation so you can check it out. So the way that the plan is structured is there are the three sections, climate action, resiliency, and environmental sustainability. And within environmental sustainability, there's three components. And each area of the five that you see listed has an overarching result that we're going to achieve by 2030. So for climate action, that's a 50% reduction in total emissions that I talked about a little earlier. And environmental sustainability that is reducing our overall use 
and um, increasing efficiency of our use of our resources. And for resiliency, it's really an emphasis not only on preparing for climate change, but also just preparing for emergencies. So the resiliency action or the resiliency results, which there are four, target being prepared for all types of natural disasters and emergencies, not just climate change, but also another pandemic or the highway getting closed because of a wildfire, anything like that. So the four results in resiliency target self-sufficiency of our community, water security, ensuring that our vulnerable populations have equitable access to resources during emergency situations, and then maintaining a strong sense of community throughout emergencies. So the way that the plan looks, if you get a chance to flip through it, there's each of those five areas has its own section. Each section has the results, what we're gonna achieve by 2030, and then a series of goals, strategies, and actions. And this is an action plan. So this is goal two from energy, which has to do with increasing energy efficiency of new and existing buildings. And then strategy A is improving efficiency of new buildings. And these are all the actions that are gonna get us there by 2030. And you can see action one right here, which has to do with improving our energy code is highlighted. Throughout the plan, there's highlights for really high priority actions. Um, so each action has action, a metric, an indicator of success, which is a metric for measuring whether or not it gets accomplished, uh, a greenhouse gas reduction potential, an, a deadline, an estimated cost, and the participating stakeholders who will be crucial for implementation. Uh, there also are, at the end of each section, a series of community spotlights. So these are highlighting the amazing things that are already happening in this community because there are a lot. So in the waste section, we have a bit about the rocket composter here on campus. And then uh, some more about compost that you'll hear about later from Sean in this community forum. And then we talk about the producers guild, which is helping secure local food sovereignty for the Gunnison Valley, as well as the Gunnison Green Business Program that Jenny talked about earlier. So the community has been a crucial part of this planning process since the beginning. They're the ones who emphasized to local government that we need to have a sustainability plan. They were crucial during the process like Jenny talked about, and they are also gonna be crucial during the implementation process. So one of the key next steps is we're going to be establishing the Gunnison Resiliency Task Force. And this is gonna be a voluntary board um, made up of diverse stakeholders who are gonna take on the actions identified in this plan with the framework of these competing priorities like affordability and environmental sustainability. So ideally this board is going to be made up of a really diverse group of stakeholders. So not just people who are really passionate about climate action, but also local businesses and local home builders so that we can get some equitable action. And equitable action has been a really important part of this entire plan, as we talked about with climate justice. Climate justice is this idea, again, that in climate change is an environmental problem, but it's also a hugely social problem. And our vulnerable populations are going to be more impacted by climate change. And here in the Gunnison Valley, our vulnerable populations are low income, elderly, and immigrant populations. And so while we applied a climate justice framework to all 170 actions in this plan, there's a few that I'd like to highlight that are very specifically targeted at creating this climate justice. So in the resiliency section, there's a focus on, on um, energy and food sovereignty. So making sure that everyone has access to clean local energy and healthy local food, as well as that specific action that's about vulnerable populations and having equitable access to emergency resources. Another really important part of climate justice is energy efficiency. So doing energy efficiency projects for low income buildings is really helpful because if it's efficient, it's decreasing our overall carbon emissions, as well as it's lowering the energy cost burden for families. And in a place like Gunnison, where you need a lot of heat and heat is very expensive, sometimes that cost of energy can be pretty debilitating. So that's how we're trying to lift up uh, our vulnerable population, as well as decrease our carbon emissions. And finally, throughout this process, we've had a lot of bilingual outreach. Uh, we had interpreters at the open house, and most of the things that we've produced have been available in English and Spanish. And the plan will be available online in both English and Spanish. So having the plan published 
in English and Spanish is one specific example of how we can take local climate action that increases climate justice. And Jenny is gonna give you a few more concrete examples. Thank you. So like we talked about earlier, throughout this process, Shannon and I have realized that local action and community collaboration can help mitigate that eco despair that we feel and that we know that so many of you feel. Uh, but that's not to say that we should not be holding industry accountable because we absolutely should. And we believe that individual voices and actions are a part of that. So climate action can look like a million different things because social justice work is inherently climate action. If you're doing work in your community to make it more just, there will be climate benefits, even if it's not obvious. Actions could look like improving self-sufficiency through backyard gardening or working to help decrease the energy burden of low-income populations through energy efficiency upgrades or increasing the capacity for renewables like our fellow panelist, Chris Maderi, will talk about in a little bit or increasing equitable access to our social systems like education and healthcare. All of that is climate action because it is social justice work. Without housing justice, we will not have climate justice. Without racial justice, we will not have climate justice. Without equitable access to reproductive care, we will not have climate justice. Your individual actions matter and your voice matters. And so we wanna give you some options of things to do here in the Gunnison Valley to make your voice heard. Volunteer with a nonprofit. There are over 140 of them here in the Gunnison Valley. You can go on the, the Community Foundation for the Gunnison Valley's website and find volunteer opportunities with many of these organizations. It's right up there and we will provide that for people online in the future. We also encourage you to support local businesses and producers. Many of the producers in the Valley offer community supported agriculture or CSA shares and our local farmers markets accept SNAP benefits. We also encourage you to go to city council and show your support for actions and policies that promote climate justice. City council meets on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month at 5.30 p.m. at city hall, which is at 201 West Virginia Avenue. If you sign up in advance, you can have a three minute commenting period at the beginning of each session where any resident can go and share issues or bring forward anything that they'd like to city council. You can find their biweekly agendas and packets on the city of Gunnison's website under city council if you'd like to know what they're going to be talking about in advance. Or join a committee like a sustainability advisory board in your community or a Gunnison resiliency task force. You can go on city or county's websites and find out whether there are availabilities on committees or boards and keep an eye out for that resiliency task force later this year or provide your comments during a public commenting period. No action is too small. Do whatever you have the capacity to do. Your individual actions matter. And so to end this presentation, we would like to hear from you because you're the constituents of this valley and your voices matter. How do you take climate action? It can look like really just about anything. It could be something I mentioned or it could be something totally new. Woo! Anyone else? Growing food, composting, boating, yeah. Taking the bus, woo! Yeah, publishing reliable information. Yes. Woo. Well, thank you so much. Those are all great examples. I know that you're all doing work in your own way. And I hope that all of you continue to do that work and empower others to take action as well. We'd like to thank you for coming to our presentation and all of our many, many, many acknowledgements for the people who helped us create the plan. Like we said, it is really a community-driven plan and we couldn't have done it without you. In particular, we would like to thank city manager, Russ Forrest. He was our supervisor.
And we would like to thank our academic mentors, MJ Pickett, Linda Judici, and Drs. Kate Clark, Ricardo Vasquez, and John Hausdorfer. We'd like to thank our graphic designer, Margaret Morgan, for creating this beautiful plan. We'd like to thank our family, our friends, and our funders, Arjun Gupta and Butch Clark. And of course, we'd like to thank each other because this in every sense of the word was a collaborative project. And I'm so thankful for Shannon and thankful for all of you. Thanks. <laughs> Here's the QR code if you want to check out the plan, if you didn't get to see it, and if you're online, hopefully you can scan it. We'll take questions. Why did you do this? <laughs> Sweet. Couple questions. Yeah. Shannon and sure. Jenny, please repeat it for the Yeah, um, the question was about how our working style was together. How did we collaborate? Um, I, for not knowing Shannon before this and being thrown into it together, I think we worked incredibly well. We were kind of a yin and yang. Shannon with her engineering background and me with my community outreach, international development background. Um, I think they really paired well together. And I know I learned a lot from Shannon. Hope she learned a lot from me. Um, and we were able to create a really successful plan that was backed in science and involved a lot of community members um, because of one another. So I wouldn't have wanted to do this without her. Yeah. And we've, the two of us have been living this plan for the last year, like no boundaries, texting each other every day, 7 a.m., 10 p.m., to work on this. So it's been the two of us working on it for the last year, pretty much cohesively. <laughs> More questions. Thanks, Sam. There's someone who is too long. So when you were talking about like the metrics piece, I was just wondering how you determine like X metrics equals success, essentially. And I can expound. Yeah, so do I need to repeat the question? Okay, so uh, in the plan, there's, like I said, 170 actions, and each action has an indicator of success. So if you look at the plan, um, a lot of them are like, is this policy implemented? Yes, no. Did we decrease carbon emissions? Yes, no. Did we increase water conservation in the city? Yes, no. And they're, the actions are written in a way that they're really measurable. Um, and so hopefully achieving them by the deadline, using that indicator or that metric of success is pretty straightforward for the policymakers and stakeholders involved in the process. Does that answer your question, kind of? Uh, yeah, so we, a huge part of this process is looking at other communities, climate action plans and sustainability plans, specifically mountain communities, as well as we really leaned on ICLE, which is Local Governments for Sustainability, to help us with a lot of these measurable metrics. Um, but a lot of them, while we were coming up with the action items, it was us working with the stakeholders to come up with specific very specific actions that we could take and they were the measure of success is hopefully pretty straightforward from that like yes no policy implemented or water decrease uh, but yeah we use a lot of other communities sustainability plans and a lot of stakeholder uh, input to design those actions well we'll have time Thanks. for cross panel questions at the end now it's time to change and I would like to welcome our fellow panelist, Chris, to talk about modeling solarization in Western Colorado.
Thanks, Shannon and Jenny. They really did a great job uh, having worked in climate action planning myself over the past couple of years. Can attest, really A plus work. Um, so yeah, I'm Chris Pideri. I'm feeling really nervous. Um, I, my project is on the renewable energy transition and specifically modeling solarization uh, here in Western Colorado. <clears throat> Here's a few of the things we're gonna be talking about today. I'm not gonna read all these. Um, yeah, some of the research context, as well as a basic introduction to climate change, uh, go over some of the results for two of the five substations analyzed, and a discussion of those results, why they kind of make sense and why they kind of don't. <clears throat> so global context, uh, climate crisis and global warming, have you ever heard of it? Um, it's a pretty old idea, first uh, <laughs> brought about by Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, over 200 years ago now. Um, and since then, we've pretty much been dragging our feet. Groups like the IPCC and conventions like COP26 produce reports, PACs, and other voluntary agreements to try to mitigate um, emissions and avoid the worst of climate impacts. But few countries' targets uh, sufficiently reduce emissions to abate that magic number 1.5 degrees of warming uh, from pre-industrial levels and no country is on track to even meet said lofty goals. Um, that is from the perspective of uh, the world. Uh, of course, local action, like here in the Gunnison Valley, uh, we may very much well be on track. <clears throat> More uh, information on uh, global climate action here. As of November last year, we're about 1.2 degrees of warming since pre-industrial levels, and our current actions put us at about 2.7 degrees of warming. Um, in other words, we're quickly approaching a tipping point that brings additional challenges and adds to the unstable and uncertain tone of today. If we want to abate the worst of these impacts, we need to act fast locally and with diverse actions. Um, I think Shannon and Jenny did a really good job of covering what diverse actions are, so I'm gonna skip that. <clears throat> uh, my research focused specifically on the energy sector. Okay, so here is the energy mix here in the United States. That is how we produce electricity, the, the resources we use to do that. Um, and as you can see, coal and natural gas dominate the mix uh, and have for a very long time. And currently we meet about 20% of our electricity needs with renewables, hydro, wind, and solar here in the United States. Um, and the energy sector in general accounts for about 40% of our emissions. You probably missed it on the last slide, but yes, that tiny purple sliver is solar energy. <laughs> about 5% of our energy mix here in the United States. Pretty cool trends uh, in the solar industry in general here in the United States. Uh, that little sliver doesn't re really represent the progress that's been made over the past years. Um, so since 1976, the price of solar, um, that is dollars per watt, uh, has fallen 99.6% from about $100 to about four cents per watt. Pretty cool. Um, over that same time period, we've seen an exponential increase in our installed solar capacity. Um, and though solar generation remains a small portion of our energy mix, um, these trends show it can play an ever more important role uh, in our future. So here are some of the terms that I'll be defining over the next couple slides, trying to build up some energy literacy here. This project um, was definitely a big uh, task for me coming in, as I would say, uh, an energy novice. So here's a crash course on some of the terms that you'll need to understand. Hopefully it makes my research make sense. <clears throat> Here is a basic description of uh, an energy grid. I think most of us are aware that our electricity comes from the grid, a network of electricity generation, power plants, transmission and distribution infrastructure. Generation happens typically at a large power plant far away where you convert some resource, coal, natural gas, uranium, solar, wind, hydro, etc., into usable electricity. It then goes from these power generating stations to uh, transmission lines that are typically high voltage and then to a substation 
where they transform the high voltage electricity and then distribute it uh, to uh, houses for local use. That slide it doesn't really show you what's going on with electricity generation. Here are some photos that are associated with electricity generation from around the world. This is what transmission typically looks like. And the portion of our energy grid that we're most familiar with, this is what local distribution and use looks like here in Western Colorado. Starting to get a little bit more focused. Um, Tri-state, you can't really talk about grid electricity here in rural Colorado uh, without talking about Tri-state. Tri-state is a non-for-profit cooperative power provider that operates in Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Nebraska. Uh, and it comes with a lot of benefits. Tri-state members uh, have access to robust generation and transmission uh, technologies, as well as electricity management services. Um, Tri-state plans to add about two gigawatts of renewable generation capacity in 2024. Pretty cool. <clears throat> so yeah, as I said, Tri-state supplies power to most of rural Colorado, about 53 of 64 counties. Um, Col Col uh, and sorry, excuse me, Colorado co-ops remain limited in their capacity to uh, produce their own electricity locally. Uh, due to tri-state contracts. So these uh, bars in red here are all local uh, power providers here in Colorado. San Miguel Power is the one that I focused on. And since this time, all four co-ops um, have renegotiated their contract to allow for more local uh, generation. San Miguel Power Association. Uh, I was really, really grateful to be able to work with such a cool local co-op uh, over the past year. They really, uh, from guidance to helping me understand their 30 minute load data, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, beyond grateful to have their guidance and support uh, through this process. Uh, they supply power to about six counties um, in Western Colorado, as well as the mountain towns of Telluride, Ure, Mountain Village, Ophir, um, yeah, next slide. <clears throat> so being, being limited in their contract, it starts to beg the question, um, how much solar generation and storage can be added to the SMPA service area without backfeeding onto tri-state's grid? And backfeeding is producing so much electricity that you, can, you can't store it or use it, so you have to sell it back to the larger grid. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on here, bear with me. <clears throat> on the right, we have two substations that are analyzed. Um, these substations have the, uh, I would say the two typical load profiles, the two typical daily profiles that we saw across the region. Um, starting with Sunshine on the top, Sunshine services the ski area. So of course, from nine to 4 p.m., you got a big electric load. <clears throat> Ure, it's a dom uh, predominantly residential load. So this is where we see in the morning and evening hours, those two kind of distinct peaks. I used Homer hybrid optimization of multiple energy resources uh, to assess what combination of solar generation and lithium ion storage um, can produce uh, significant decreases in electricity consumption uh, without backfeeding. Uh, can we actually go back one slide? Sorry. A uh, quick comment on these colorful bars you see on the bottom. This might be the first time you're seeing uh, this heat map. Uh, maybe a little bit unusual at first, but I think it starts to make sense uh, as you get used to them. The x-axis is the day of the year. So starting on the left, that's January 1st. All the way on the right, that's December 31st. The y-axis is hour of the day. So the very bottom would be midnight. The very top would be approaching midnight. Um, on that same day, 6 and 18, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the color is the intensity. So those dark blues are the lowest intensity and those dark reds are the highest intensity. <clears throat> so here are some of the results. Again, heat maps, bear with me. 
that top chart is the output from the solar array and that's a four megawatt array. So we can see, of course, during the daylight hours, longer in the summer, that's when we have the most electricity generation. Homer also takes into account, uh, uh, what's the right word, weather variability. So those kind of splotches you see across the, that top chart uh, is Homer taking into account cloudy days. <clears throat> that second chart is the state of charge for the lithium ion battery, which you'll probably notice is wildly oversized. We're gonna talk about that in the discussion section. Uh, and we can see during the summer months uh, around the evening, that's when it's approaching 100%. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it fully reached 100% at any point across the year. And that bottom chart is grid electricity purchases. So if you remember from the previous slide, that chart looked much more colorful. And now we're seeing there are portions of the year where you are no longer buying electricity, uh, in this case from Tri-State. Pretty cool. Next chart, this is for the URA substation. Um, pretty similar output from the solar panel. Of course, daylight hours, you're not gonna be producing anything at night. Um, and another wildly oversized <laughs> uh, battery system. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And I would say the most, or the, the biggest difference here is that there's a portion of the summer where you're really not purchasing very much electricity at all um, at the URA substation level. Okay, so what's next? Of course, solar development uh, takes a lot of space and in the San Miguel Power Association service area, it, it's a pretty diverse place. Uh, I, I think for those of us here in the Gunnison Valley, I mean, imagine putting lots and lots of solar next to Mount Crested Butte, it might be challenging. There are other portions of the county that are more suited as well as different substations may be more suited to meet their electric needs with electricity. Um, moving on to cost effectivity, and we're gonna talk about those oversized systems a bit here too. Um, local power providers will have to weigh the cost effectivity of the of savings produced from purchasing less like grid electricity compared to the cost of storage and the panels themselves. Um, so when you are reducing your, your grid electricity purchases by uh, millions of kilowatt hours a year by, by pursuing some of these systems, you are receiving significant savings. Batteries, especially if it's over 100 megawatt hours of battery storage for a substation may not be the most financially feasible, but to speculate, there are some other storage options available, such as using uh, some of the reservoirs here across uh, Western Colorado to meet those uh, high loads. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, renewables require a lot of minerals. And as we as we pursue more and more of these things, it's important to be aware of the impacts we have uh, both domestically and internationally because of those uh, mineral demands. A lot of people helped out. I wish I had a ready-made list of names like Shannon and Jenny did, but I'm gonna do my best to read through them quickly. Uh, Wiley and Kevin from SMPA, Emma and Kim from EcoAction Partners, uh, Dave and Rich here from uh, Western and the rest of the MEM staff. Tucker, Garrett, and Paul from uh, Telluride Institute, my friends and family, and of course, Chris and John Holstrom of Tompton Farm. And with that, I welcome your questions. Totally. So the question is, um, Chris, your research focused on relatively large scale systems. Um, <laughs> it, did you look at smaller scale systems such as rooftop uh, solar uh, and then a question specifically about net metering? Um, so short answer, no, you're correct. Um, I, this, this research focuses on the substation level. Um, of course, uh, being involved with this type of stuff, uh, distributed solar, so rooftop uh, deployment of solar as well as net metering comes up quite a bit. 
Um, and you also asked about the tri-state uh, contracts there. So net metered systems actually don't count towards those, towards those limits. So a lot of tri-state member co-ops do have programs to, to encourage that. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with net metering, I'm sure you are familiar with your electricity meter. It goes up when you're using electricity. And if you have a solar panel on your roof, it goes down when you are producing elect excess electricity. Um, I think those systems are really cool. And I think that's totally a part of um, the renewable energy transition. Absolutely. And I think that we could probably achieve a good chunk of increased storage capacity as well with, with distributed home storage systems. Um, great question. All right, now we have time for questions for the whole panel, so. <laughs> Great job. And Are we sitting? Are we sitting? Yeah. well, from people at distance, we have some questions. And I want to begin with a question from Dana Lehman uh, to Jenny and Shannon. And this is, were there moments where your stakeholders had trouble communicating with each other or disagreed? How did you all navigate inter-stakeholder communication? Quite an interesting question. Uh, Microphone. I, I feel like our stakeholders worked pretty well together um, from what we have experienced. There were, um, I guess mostly in the energy sector, there were maybe some differences of opinion. Um, during our stakeholder workshop meeting, there were um, definitely, yeah, some, some differences of opinion on maybe what was feasible, what was best. And uh, I think that really challenged our facilitator skills. And thankfully we had um, the help of our supervisor for that. Um, and then also, I don't know about if it's so much our stakeholders, but I, I mean, I guess, yeah, um, during some of the last city council meetings, we heard from some energy providers who, were, who had some concerns about some of the energy actions in our plan. And in order to help make them feel heard, we have invited them to sit on our Gunnison Resiliency Task Force. And so hopefully, um, because I mean, they do have some fair points about affordability of energy and affordable housing. And so we really welcome the diverse array of of thinking and we uh, definitely don't want this to be an echo chamber. So we really did welcome differences of opinion throughout this process. But I would say overall, we had a pretty pretty good working experience with, with many of those stakeholders. And I would say they did with each other as well. Thanks for the question, okay, Dana. Thank you. Okay, the question was, how do we balance um, diverse perspectives? Technocratic thinking, yeah. So the technical side of everything with the justice-based thinking. And so um, 
the best example that I think we have is really focusing in our plan on, and Chris can speak to this too, I'm sure, efficiency. So from a technical perspective, energy efficiency upgrades are not the, the big winner for emissions reductions, like converting our grid to all renewable energy or carbon free energy and you're nodding because we had this conversation. <laughs> um, but uh, energy efficiency upgrades are really, really important for for reducing emissions somewhat and also reducing the cost burden on our vulnerable populations. There's a graph in Gunny Cares that shows that the lowest percent, the lowest income bracket within Gunnison, and this is true statewide, but it's particularly exacerbated in that communities like Gunnison, the lowest income bracket pays the highest percentage of their income on energy. And that's because energy is expensive, houses are old. Yeah, and it, it's, it's expensive to heat really old, inefficient houses. Thanks for the question, Lauren. I'm not gonna try to repeat it because you're a very eloquent speaker. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the answer is kind of both and like it's a very necessary to balance like you can use technical or technical thinking to uh, ensure that you're getting those equitable outcomes that you want. Um, and so just to expand upon uh, what Shannon and Jenny just said here, like, um, yeah, maybe the lowest income people shouldn't be paying even the same rate for electricity, uh, like price per kilowatt hour. Um, and I think that that is starting to happen in some places and the broader conversation around uh, like timed rates, time, time of use, um, as well as the transition to local renewables or ensuring that, um, ensuring that there's programs, you know, if people want to pursue rooftop solar and things like this to, to offset their electricity bills or maybe it becomes a small net, net gain for them monetarily over time. Um, yeah, I think, I think using these these tools in tandems both both types of thinking will will bring about the best outcomes now we have a question for chris medari from corey s uh interested to know what you mean by the sizing of the storage what made it oversized yes uh so Essentially what was happening, this is a great question, uh, and I saw the time come up, so I kind of skipped this explanation, so thank you. Um, <laughs> the storage size, and I'm thinking of the Sunshine Station here, I'm thinking it's about a four megawatt array with uh, over 100 megawatt hours of storage. Um, and uh, with Rich's guidance, actually yesterday at a short meeting, he told me that essentially these systems were so large that you, that they were so large to accommodate the excess electricity that you were using during the summertime, or sorry, producing during the summertime, not using, so the, the time of year when your demand is lowest but your production is highest. The, the optimal system design in this case, um, use that excess storage to then allow to essentially store for the entire year to then dispatch during the winter time. So that's why they would be uh, considered oversized. Uh, and again, this is part, uh, part of the reason is um, SMPA and I decided that um, doing like a financial cost benefit analysis was not within the scope of this project. Um, and so that's why some of the outcomes were like that, because if you're not so focused on the price of lithium ion batteries, then all of a sudden large, large systems become more reasonable. Great answer, thank you. Um, yeah, there. The question was about how we're trying to help the local food movement here in Gunnison and what some of those actions were. I believe it is in strategy D of, re of result one of, of the plan, but some of, of resiliency, yeah, of resiliency. <laughs> um, but some of the actions included um, helping to promote the uh, um, creation of the massive passive, which is hopefully going to happen here on campus. And 
I'm trying to think of some of the other actions right now. <laughs> it's a lot of providing support for local agriculture, as well as, um, yeah, the producer's guilt, but also thinking more holistically, like we talk a lot about waste and compost, and that is indirectly, but directly supporting local agriculture, supporting them gold. Also, uh, um, having the city purchase local food for citywide events, because there is so much food that is grown locally here. And um, that's definitely a way to reduce vehicle miles travel to food and a way to reduce the plastic use and all of those um, other aspects that come along with, with food because there are, yeah, it's, <laughs> food is one of those, those things that you can, you know, there are so many different wicked problems associated with food. Like any problem that you think of, it could probably be tied back to food, which also means that there are so many solutions in food as well. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that it was a, an important part of resiliency, uh, especially being out here in rural Colorado, where if, like Shannon said, we get cut off from the highways, from a wildfire, or, or there's a supply chain shortage, things like that, um, climate change, you know, affecting the growing season and causing the increase in food prices in California. And so making sure that our city operations and our people are resilient to any of those changes. Food is, is so necessary and so important, which is why you'll hear so many different conversations about food over the next three days. We thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, panel. I, I'm always impressed at the amount of learning that happens for me in these sessions and congratulate you in thinking about your goals and objectives in your project and looking at where you've come and how you've, how you've aligned your work with your values and what you wanted to do in the world and just very impressed with that. I'd like to ask the audience now to join me in congratulating Jenny Nitsky, Shannon Hesler, Chris Maderi, Please stand and be welcomed as Masters of Environmental Management. And with that, I'd like to introduce the next panel, Earth, Water, Fire. I hope I got that order right. A uh, lot of cool research going on about some of the public lands here in Gunnison County.